Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Julia Schnabel, a very well-known member of our Mikai community. She graduated with a master in computer science at the Technical University of Berlin and a PhD in computer science at the University College London and subsequently held postdoctoral positions at University College London, King's College London and University Medical Center Utrecht before becoming first associate professor and then full professor of engineering science at the University of Oxford. In 2015, she joined King's College London as chair in computational imaging. Julia's research focuses on machine and deep learning, complex motion modeling, as well as multimodal and quantitative imaging for a range of medical imaging applications. She is serving on the editorial board of Medical Image Analysis, is Associate Editor for IEEE Transactions on Medical Imaging and IEEE Transactions on Biomedical Engineering, and has recently founded the new free open source journal of machine learning for biomedical imaging, the Melba Journal. She has been program chair of Mikai 2018, is a general chair of IPMI 2021, and will be the general chair of Mikai 2024 to be held for the first time in Africa. She is elected member of the IEEE EMBS Administrative Committee and the Mikai Society Board of Directors and an elected fellow of the Mikai Society. Ellis and IEEE. So it's a great pleasure to have her here and today she will give a presentation that is entitled Smart Imaging from Sensors to Information. Julia, it's a great pleasure to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So the stage is yours. Andreas, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'd love to be there in person. Um, and uh, I love the area I'm quite often actually in, in lovely Franconia. I've been there last summer after isolating suitably um, just for a few days, but of course there's no, no point in currently in coming for a lab visit if you're all at home anyway. So thank you very much for joining. Um, this is, this is kind of the area where I would normally be, be working, central London in all its glory. Um, I'll see whether you can actually see my, my, uh, my pointer. I'm not sure whether you can. Uh, London Eye is, is one of the main landmarks now. St. Thomas's Hospital is this building over here. And we're just opposite now, but we've got a lot of lab space in St. Thomas's and a fantastic view um, across the river to Westminster. So um, today I want to talk about smart medical imaging. It's a bit like bringing um, colds to Newcastle, not anymore since the miners stopped now <laughs> doing colds in the UK. But I mean, I know you've been really, really active in that area. So I feel quite um, humbled to actually be able to present to you. Let me just get a bit more shade. It's very sunny in London today. Um, I have no disclosures other, th other than the funders who um, support our work. One of the main um, funding sources we currently have that, that I'm reporting on here is the Smart Heart Grant, uh, which is a, a joint collaboration with Imperial College London and Oxford. And I find which again is uh, with Imperial College and, and, and us at King's. So these are the two main ones I'm going to report on, but there's a lot of other things uh, going on at King's. Um, and I'm very grateful for that funding. So smart medical imaging. In medical imaging, we normally fall into one of these following groups, which are almost silos. We, we either work on image acquisition, where we generate raw data and use some imaging sensor, or we work on image reconstructions where we want to transform the raw sensor data into some image or other, other form uh, of, of information that we can then view. 
or I traditionally come from the image so-called post-processing corner where we start with filtering reconstructed images, we segment them, we register them and so on. And then the actual image analysis would start where you try to make more sense of the data where you do volumetry, where you construct models, where you start detecting things and maybe run a classification. And then comes the clinical image interpretation. Usually this is like a pipeline of very disjoint um, uh, modules that, that you're targeting. And it goes from, from medical physicists over computer scientists to clinicians. Um, machine learning has kind of taken over our world. I mean, it's been, it's been there for, for decades, of course, but uh, with, with more data and more computing time, we actually started tackling all these individual silos um, for, for some time, but we, we still do it not, not across these different groups. So we usually either do one or the other. And, and some of our work, and I'm sure your work as well, I'm quite, quite, I know your work as well, is starting to actually bridge across these different domains. And there is, there is some benefit and not just treating reconstructed images as some source of data, because there's so much imaging physics and other things behind it. And we can also learn from the clinicians on the other end, of course, as well. So Computer vision is where we kind of um, get our best ideas from. We're kind of very good in, in, in stealing stealing and grabbing the best ideas and trying to get them work on our much more complex um, but sparser data. So AI comes from the 1950s. Alan Turing, I have to mention, I'm based in the UK, so he's the father of AI. You could go back to Bayes and other people, of course. Um, machine learning since the 1980s and deep learning really lifted on in the, in the 2010s. I still don't know how to call that decade. But actually, deep learning started also in the 1990s or late 1980s as well. Um, but people just didn't get very far with that. Um, of course, computer vision has the advantage. If you open Google Images or go to ImageNet, there's just tons and tons of data and tons and tons of annotations. The problems quite often are fairly simple. You want to say, is this a strawberry? Or find me the traffic light. And, and you, you know all these captures, which you actually but where you actually help annotating um, the world. When you enter a capture, this is where you actually start identifying these things or whether what kind of sports uh, this, this person is playing. Um, but then the architectures which we are, um, which we are looking at in deep learning um, or in machine learning are quite simple quite often. And, and I'm, I'm not claiming to do anything really grand here, but quite often we are just looking at, um, for example, a, a simple classification task. We want to say, is there a cat or a dog in this image? And we just you know, have some, some convolutional layers, some max pooling layers, and then some maybe fully connected layer and some soft max at the end. So these are the basic building blocks of deep learning. You've got some activation function, and you're already in business. So there's not much different to traditional um, uh, image analysis, only that we just learn all these things on lots of data. We automatically find features rather than, than forcing them onto the data. And of course, we can then do simple tasks. We can start segmenting cats, for example. We can also reconstruct data. We can denoise and filter data. So all these things we've, we've just adopted in medical imaging, but medical imaging is of course much more complex. Here you see a CINA MR view, a white blood sequence, you see the moving heart, you've got different cardiac phases. This is just a 2D slice. There are some, some 3D or multi-slice acquisitions. Um, you maybe want to segment the left and right ventricle, the myocardium, um, uh, to measure the blood pool at systole and systole and start extracting useful information. So, okay, going from computer vision to medical imaging, if you just work in 2D, it's, it's probably quite straightforward. We can do similar things. Here I'm just showing a simple classification task. Is this an image of good or bad quality? So all we need is tons and tons of images which somebody annotated as being of good and bad um, uh, quality and, and we can also do a regression task we can actually say how bad the quality is if we've got suitable annotations if they're great the quality of the image we can also do the the usual thing we can segment uh, our heart we can use the standard unit um, encoder decoder architecture with some some um, 
some shortcuts there um, and to, to do the segmentation quite nice as you can do you know simultaneous segmentation depending on how many labels you have so that that works quite nice and it's really really fast once you've trained your models you can also do it to 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 just not just classify poor quality images, you can also denoise images. You can kind of restore the original image quality. So if you have a lot of good quality image and you, images and you artificially degrade them, you could just say you add noise or you distort them in any way. And then you train a network against the, the good version, feeding at the bad versions of the image. You can actually restore the original quality to quite some, some good degree. So that's also quite interesting. So you could call that reconstruction. Since we're here in the spatial domain, I would call it more restoration or denoising. Or it's, it's, a, it's a filtering operation, a post-processing operation. Since we're an MRI, it's quite nice to think about actually how these images were formed. So we actually operate, could would also operate in case space, so in the Fourier domain, as the data are coming off from the image center. And then only uh, maybe denoise the images while we're reconstructing the data at the same time. And I'll show you some examples of that, why that might be beneficial. So this is like my, my mini primer of deep learning. <laughs> and, and I hope you've, you've got some, some good background in that. I'm kind of following Andreas's lectures because it was really good inspiration for me during like lockdown of how I could give my lectures. But these are these are still the vanilla building blocks which we're all using. Of course, they're, they're more, more complicated networks. But the nice thing is because they're simple and they work, it's quite good to start off with these. So if we apply machine learning and medical imaging, there are a lot of challenges which we, we might not have in computer vision, or we have different challenges in computer vision. So we've got quite often poor quality of image data. And that's because patients are being patients. They, they are, you know, they move, they breathe, they're, they, they have physiological motion, they're, they're anxious. Uh, so, so there's lots of things to consider there. And there are also image acquisition related artifacts. There's vibration of the scanner, but uh, there, there are, I'll show you maybe some, some fetal motion later on. So there are lots of, lots, lots of things too, which are just really specific to medical imaging, uh, which could affect the quality of the image data, which might mean we can't use that data for training our fabulous networks. We also, that goes hand in hand, we don't have these really nice, big, well curated annotated databases. There are some emerging, and, and we are using a lot UK Biobank, which is absolutely fantastic. We've got access to 100,000 data sets. Uh, they're actually doing follow-up scans now. They've been also quite active now in during COVID to follow up those in that study who actually had COVID and they're following up with long COVID. So it's really, really good population um, database. And you've got NACO, the Nationale Cohorte in Germany, um, where, where you could also do similar things, but UK Biobank is, is open to everyone. But the problem with these nice well curated annotated database which are there these are generally volunteers there is just a normal population uh, prevalence of certain diseases like cardiac diseases as you would expect between 40 to 7 year olds to be in the population but it's probably slightly lower there because volunteers tend to be a bit more healthy if you've got a cardiac problem you're probably less likely to volunteer so they don't reflect what's in, in clinical practice and, and clinical data is much more varied. We've got also differences across different scanning systems. If you want to pool data and across, across the hospital, we operate, if, if you run multi-center trials, we've got slightly different acquisition protocols and of course uh, 1.5 Tesla scanner from Siemens here and there might not give you the same result. There's uh, also some reproducibility which is lacking there. And generally with, with, with all these machine, especially deep learning approaches, you, you take a, often a black box approach and which gives you a bit of lack of interpretability. You sort of throw in data as you get it and you try to present that to a clinician that's not very satisfactory. So in this talk, I want to focus a little bit on, on how we can apply machine or particular deep learning along the entire imaging pipeline, really from almost acquisition in some cases from acquisition to interpretation. And I, I don't do everything. I don't go always from one end to the other. I operate still on, on, on different um, parcellations around that pipeline, but maybe that gives you some ideas of where you could, you know, also could work on. So 
some of our approaches are still quite modular. So we take a post, like a reconstructed image and segment it, but we're getting more and more integrated and, and working on these so-called end-to-end approaches where we try to do all in one, which is, I think, really, really exciting. I'll give you some examples from cardiac MR imaging, just like the one I've, I've showed you at the beginning. Also some recent work on chest CT for early detection of lung cancer and some of our work on fetal and maternal ultrasound. So three different modalities, three different applications. Hopefully there's something in there for, for everyone. One of the focuses of our work here, especially because we've got lack of data sometimes, we work on clinical data, is that we need to think about data augmentation. So how can we enrich our training data in, um, in a realistic way um, and, and, and add new training data generated from our existing training data to help us in, for example, doing image quality control, but also solving further downstream tasks. And we are, I'll go so a little bit at the end into some real-time solutions and all of these things, because deep learning at inference time is just so fantastically quick, have the potential to actually feed into the image acquisition in the end. And this, that's the dream of everyone, that you've got a push button approach, you've got a patient in the scanner, automatically the best sequence, the best angle is, is chosen, and you immediately get the clinical interpretation. You know, it's just push off a button. And I think deep learning has the potential. We're not there yet, but I think everybody should, should start working towards that goal. We've been talking about this, I should say, since the 1990s. Uh, we had a different name for it. I can't remember now, but it's um, it was a one-stop shop solution, I think they called it at the time. And now it's, it's um, you know, uh, basically active scanning or whatever you want to name it. Um. So in cardiac imaging, we really have the problem of image quality. And, and that means that sometimes patients have to be sent home again or have to be called in again. Data has to be discarded or, or you get actually a wrong diagnosis, which would be the worst of, of, of all cases. So on the left-hand side, you see um, a high quality um, cardiac scan, a short axis scan and a corresponding resulting segmentation, really nice. It's just a vanilla, almost unit, slightly polished segmentation method. So everything's fine. You see the papillary muscles have been excluded from the segmentation. You see the blood pool where it should be, everything is fine. On the right-hand side, you see the same image, which we artificially degraded in a special way. And I'll explain to that in a moment in what way. And if you have an image like that, but you've trained your, your segmentation algorithm only on that nice public database or your nice quality control cl clinical data, it will fail. It will just give you results like this. It will, it will produce segmentations which you, you can't use, where you can't uh, extract, say, ejection fraction or anything else from that. So that's a problem. So could we retrospectively, after having acquired the images, uh, improve this image quality? And are we then able to improve the segmentation? I mean, that would be a very nice thing to do that would allow us to actually tap into our large database of poor quality hospital data acquired over decades, maybe, and rescue data and actually add to our training databases as well. So the answer is, yeah, hopefully we can. We, we can try at least. So here on the bottom, you see um, the restored image, basically taking the low quality image from the top row and restoring the quality because we've done training and then performing just a subsequent segmentation in this case. And you see the segmentation is not identical to, to, the, to the original segmentation of the high quality image, but it is quite similar. I mean, you will get probably a fairly simple um, volumetric measurement from that. And it's something which might still be in the clinically acceptable tolerance. And you see also the difference of the restored image, uh, this image uh, from the high quality image. You see it's actually quite, quite close. But you also see where the problems still are. You still see some residual error. Visual inspection is always the first and last line of defense in, in image processing. So always look at the data. So how can we do that? How can we actually, you know, go from here to there? How can we rescue a segmentation and get something which is quite similar to the to the quality, high quality segmentation that we, we all strive to have? Well, first of all, and this is, I think, my main message of this talk, I hope, is it's really helpful to understand actually where these artifacts actually come from. So really understand 
what is the underlying imaging physics? How are these artifacts stemming from the image acquisition? And I'm just trying to explain here on two examples. So on the left hand side, you see again the good quality image, which I've shown you before. You see a really nice circular shape, right? Uh, uh, blood pool, high contrast edge to the myocardium. And, and you know, this is how a good image should look like. On the right hand side, you see an image also from a different patient, which has poor quality. But you might first think, well, it just maybe it's just acquired at a different phase. One is end systolic, one is end diastolic. Maybe it's just a different, you know, time in the cardiac cycle. But actually, what you see here is a motion blur. You see actually several temporal frames of the cardiac cycle at once. Basically, something has been mixed up at the acquisition. Yeah, so we actually see, rather than having this really nice sharp edge on the left-hand side, you see something which actually starts blurring. You see the, the, the myocardium kind of thickening and thinning. So this is an actual artifact. And um, there, are, there are ways, I mean, uh, radiologists look at these uh, slightly differently. They also not just look at the heart. They actually also look what happens at the liver next to it. Yeah, So we, we've left out other organs. We just focus here on the heart. We crop just the heart or the images. But this is an artifact. If you understand how this is happening, some mix up of cardiac phases, you can actually do something about it because you understand what it is. So here, here you see just a little, little summary of what, what is happening. On the left hand side, you see the, the, uh, the cardiac signal, the ECG triggering. And at short term intervals, you start acquiring data. So you've got two frames here shown as frame Y to frame N. There might be like 30 frames in that sequence. And each frame, of course, is acquired in case space. So you start, when you start triggering, you start acquiring a line of case space in one temporal frame. But of course, the heart keeps beating while you scan. So the next line you acquire in case space could be then belonging to the next phase of the cycle. Yeah, and then you keep going, you go through the whole sequence and you start filling case baselines until you're done. And when you're done, you do your inverse Fourier transform and you get the nice spatial domain images which you have. So everything is fine if you do it like this and if the trigger is fine. But sometimes these lines get mixed up and that's really, really very common actually. And, and then you could end up with a line from frame I plus J, in this case, frame N, which is being filled into frame I. And then that image gets reconstructed and you get then this exactly this artifact has talked about. So you get a corrupted image where you actually have this motion blur. You actually start going through different phases. And this artifact is called ECG mistriggering. Yeah, that's a very nice physiological and physically explainable artifact. And once you understand that, you can actually do something about it. And that's what we try. Because what we can do now is we can... Uh, we have tens of thousands of high quality images from UK Biobank. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and they're from volunteers. So in the clinic, we, we have more of these poor quality images. Unfortunately, we do not know how these poor quality images would look in real life, but we can actually take the high quality images of the volunteer and make them look really bad. We're very good at making images look bad, right? So we're kind of reversing the process. So going into case space, we have to cheat a little bit because we only get the magnitude images back, or not the face images, but you know, you can estimate the face image. Um, we can actually start corrupting case space lines and we can do as many of these corruptions as we want. We can have a sampling process, we can do it in batches because normally you would acquire two, three, maybe 10 lines of case space in one cycle before you go into the next cycle. Um, but uh, you, you can play around with it as much as possible. You can completely mess everything up if you wanted to. And you can go from high to low quality and, and get really degraded data. So you can generate training data for, for, your, for your image quality control network. This is nothing else than data augmentation, like an image net wiggling around cats and rotating them. We, we, are, we are kind of not just wiggling around, we're still doing that. We still rotate and translate our data during training, but we do these additional um, degradations. Okay, so we can then use these uh, to augment our training database. Uh, the first thing, of course, we can just use directly for image quality control. For example, to curate a database, basically sort out the good from the bad 
And uh, you can also use it to decide whether a patient needs to be rescanned to say, actually, this, this scan is too bad. We can't even process it, but we can detect it already. Um, and let's recall the patient. The more interesting thing is rather than just sorting out data and throwing it away or recalling patients, is to actually say, can we actually rescue it? Can we do a motion reconstruction? Can we avoid rescanning patients? Can we just you know, reverse the degradation, knowing how it originated, and get a good enough image so we can actually solve a further downstream task. And that would be the third thing. So can we do a segmentation? Can we do disease classification other things despite the artifacts? And that would be quite nice. So the first thing could be solved quite simply, and I've shown you basically that network. It's again, deciding um, is it is a good or poor quality image, and that would be the same as an image that's net deciding is it the dog or cat in the image. Yeah, so it's just, you just show a very simple network, evolutional network, um, uh, a series of good and bad quality images with a label of good and bad, and, you know, seeing then un unseen data, it can actually make its own decisions. It will have learned the features necessary. Now, going from poor quality to high quality data, again, requires these augmented training data. So there's a supervised approach here where uh, we can use a simple encoder decoder architecture and uh, basically rescue the data. So this is an image restoration or post-processing approach, post-reconstruction. That's, that's fairly straightforward. It's similar to just denoising an image or filtering an image. However, we know actually the artifact happened in case space. So it might make more sense to directly operate in case space um, and resolve the problem there rather than going into the spatial domain where we have lost that knowledge. The question is, how can we do that? There are many approaches to do that. And we've been through several ones. I'm just showing you, you one here. And I'm just showing it more graphically without too much um, detail just to get the main concept across. So we, we are inspired by this because we are talking about lines of case space. We know case space lines have been dislocated and rescattered across different images. And that's a bit, there's a bit of an analogy there to, to undersample data reconstruction. So in MRI, if you want to do fast acquisitions, you can decide to just um, acquire a percentage of the case space. So not fully sample the case space, but just maybe sample half of it, or maybe even go down to a quarter. And there are lots of different under sampling trajectories you can play with. Normally you would want to cover the center of case space. We're actually looking now, not just this is Cartesian sampling, we're also now looking at polar sampling, which is uh, quite nice and cardiac, it's, it lends itself to that. But you can think of different under sampling trajectories and there a lot of methods now exist. You, ISMIM, the main MR conference is swamped by these, where you, decide on undersampling trajectory, you undersample the case space, um, you get out an image which looks quite blurry, but you still have a reconstruction network, use the data consistency term, and then in the end have a, a high resolution reconstruction. Now this is for undersample data where the lines are correct as far as we know, there might still be some motion or, or artifacts there, but, but these approaches are quite effective. And they can actually get really high quality results just with a few lines of case space. So our, our idea is now to say, well, we have a fully sampled case space, but some of the lines are wrong. Yeah. So could we instead think about, could we just detect the wrong lines and chuck them out, just really get rid of them? And then we can formulate our, our artifact correction network in a, in an under, into an undersampling network. Because once we have detected, using a detection network, the wrong, um, wrongly um, placed case space lines, we can, we can just remove them and treat that as an undersampling trajectory and just treat this as an undersampling problem. And then get a nicely artifact corrected uh, and high resolution reconstruction. So that's quite neat. Um, that was our, our first step in that direction. And uh, it was quite successful. We actually got really good, good results. We, we can, I don't have the literature on this slide. I think it comes on the next slide. We put it then all together because we thought, okay, great. 
we shouldn't just always think about producing pretty images. We should also think about, can we do something useful with those images? They're still useful on their own because in the end, the radiologist doesn't look into case space. They look at a reconstructed image to make uh, a clinical diagnosis. But of course, the clinical diagnosis quite often then um, is done on more quantitative parameters, which are then extracted from those clinical images. So in the next step, and then you can now I've got here the, the, the two articles uh, published by Ilka Oxus, um, we, we actually said, okay, let's also segment the data while we're at it. And that's the nice thing about these, these deep learning networks. Either you can create a pipeline of things, you can do undersampling and, and detection, detection, undersampling, reconstruction, segmentation, one after the other, or you can just throw everything into the mix. Um, if, 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 None of you is as old as I am, I'm sure, but we've been playing around with energy functions and things uh, for, for ages. So in the end, these loss functions are quite nice and bring just different, often competing goals together. So um, this, is, this is just quite similar. So you start just expanding your network. You still have your um, data consistency term, your, your displacement detection, uh, your, your artifact detection network, your reconstruction network, but you then also have your segmentation network unit, um, uh, in there as well. And you just put this all together into one combined loss function. One, one thing to notice, and again, that's a, that's a thing about thinking about how images are acquired. We're here not even talking anymore about a single cardiac slice. We're talking about a cardiac sequence. And for me, ideally, I would have liked to find a network, and maybe one of you finds that, which doesn't just remove the wrongly uh, placed case baselines, but it reshuffles them to still, you know, so that not any information is lost, because now we're still doing undersampling, basically. But we, we could do fully sampled, maybe, or almost fully sampled, if you we were able to redistribute the, the, the case baselines and put them at the right place. But that we, we didn't follow up on that. But you can put in the whole um, cardiac sequence. You can use a recurrent network approach, LSTM, long short term memory networks, so that actually some information is shared across the cardiac cycle. And that really helps. It, it really, there's, there's some really good, um, uh, could match then across the different images. There's a lot of redundant information that then actually helps in the reconstruction of the individual slices. So they actually share information this way. What we also found in the setup, which, which, which I really like, is not only did we get really good segmentations and we could also check how well we did the displacement line detection because we had the ground truth on the training data at least, but we also found that the adding in segmentation into the mix also improved the reconstruction. So these tasks mutually help each other. It's not that we, we work now on a pipeline. It's actually by putting in the segmentation into the mix, mix some of the other um, tasks are improved as well. So they affect each other. Of course, there's always the, the big question of, of how do you weight all these losses and so on, but you, you could in principle start learning these as well. The other thing we tried here, I haven't shown an example here, is that we also um, put in good quality images and did a reconstruction of that um, without knowing basically what the ground truth would be. And actually the, the um, signal to noise ratio also popped up. So actually this could be a network which could be used also for good quality data, not just to, to rescue pure quality data. It could be just a very generic image reconstruction method which you could use. Here's some examples. So you see on the on the bottom left, a uh, heavily corrupted image. Uh, we have the difference to the original image. So this is on, from our validation set, um, and and a segmentation which is uh, less than satisfactory. And then on the right, you see then the recovered data, the difference from the original good quality data, um, and and the segmentation coming out of that. So it works. It works pretty well. We were quite happy with that. And then just finally on cardiac imaging, we are also just working on a whole pipeline now. And, and this is kind of in the middle of the pipeline. This is post reconstruction, uh, but we could put in the reconstruction work in there as well, where we actually really go like, like, a, like a check of a pilot. Once you've acquired data, you can accept or reject images that are um, 
acquired. It's the first quality check. You can then do a full cycle segmentation using a UNEP style architecture across the cardiac cycle. You can then extract automatically parameters like um, Peak, peak ejection rate uh, and then you can do a further quality control step because things can still go wrong yeah so at any part of the pipeline things can go wrong where you can actually look whether profiles of the volume curves um, are acceptable where there is consistency between the left and right ventricle um, and so on so you can use more more classifiers down there as well and then finally um, assess ventricular function so this is like a part of a longer protocol, which we are now applying to a lot of our hospital data. And we're currently working on, um, on the re putting the reconstruction. So basically not rejecting images, but maybe rescuing images uh, into that as well. And we also start working across different scanners as well. Okay. So... The next application I wanted to talk about um, is lung cancer, which is uh, still the most common or second most common cancer in, in men and women. And the problem there is that if we could detect it much earlier than we currently do, we could save a lot of lives. So usually uh, lung cancer patients present um, quite often in the accident and emergency unit with a persistent cuff. Uh, and then it's too late. Then, not, then there are not many treatment options left. So it's actually too late uh, in the stage of the cancer. But if you could find it much earlier, as is sometimes done incidentally, say you've got a cycling accident or um, have a, you know, some, something else, have a, has a chest CT for some other reason, sometimes they pick up these really small emerging nodules. So here you see... Um, uh, three data sets uh, well, from the same patients from the National Lung Screening Trial in the US. Um, this was really amazing data. You can you get, um, I forgot now, I think 15,000 cases you can uh, get sent, uh, of which um, a couple of hundred uh, happen to have or get or develop, happen to develop lung cancer during that trial. They had a really big control arm as well. They also have x-rays of, of, of another arm. And you see in lung nodule developing. So at the baseline scan, uh, you see nothing. Yeah. Uh, after a year, you see an emerging nodule. This is the kind of nodules we really like to, to detect. And on the right-hand side, you see the nodule, which has such a big size. You might be able to do intervention, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, all these things. Um, but it, it's, it's quite a late stage, so the survival rates will be much lower. So these are like uh, always taking one year apart. So the problem is in all our databases, we normally only see image C. We only see when it's too late. So you've got all these public databases, the LIDC, the lunar data set, um, all the lung cancer cases in the hospital that have shown big nodules and many nodules. Um, and it's really hard. And all our classifiers are trained mainly to detect these big nodules, which everybody can see, um, but not these small nodules, just because we have so few samples of that in our training data. We might have lots of healthy images, but then they don't have nodules. Right? Um, so we thought, well, again, think about data augmentation. Could, could we actually create very small emerging nodules from the databases we have, we've got access to? And we decided to, that's, that's uh, Octavio Martinez, who was presenting at ISB in a couple of weeks, um, to take a three-step approach. First of all, we tried to convert the image C into a pseudo-healthy version. We tried to do some, almost like, almost like a, a bit <laughs> um, unnice if I say we do a bit of a paint shop there, basically. We just, we, we do in-painting of larger nodules. So we can get image pairs like A and C, but just generated from image C. Yeah, so we, we, we give image C a pseudo healthy appearance. We then use that because we've got these image pairs, patient with and without nodule to generate smaller nodules, just to really augment our training database with samples of, of nodules of smaller size. And then we of course have to test whether this actually helps us in, in a, a normal classification or detection task. So if we augment our training database, are we now better able to detect small emerging nodules? So basically early stage lung cancer. So 
for in painting, we used we developed a 3D version of Deep Image prior. So it's a it's a very simple again auto encoder decoder architecture. That's, that's the beauty of it, where you basically um, give the algorithm uh, or, the, or the network um, the original image, including the nodule, plus the masked version. Uh, it's just a binary segmentation, basically, of the nodule. And then the task for the network is an image restoration task. It has to recreate the image, but fill in the place where the nodule is masked out, just using almost auto context. The nice thing, I think, and that was our, our, our decision to do that, rather than um, doing something with lots and lots of data, this deep image prior just trains on the actual data pair you give it. It does not use any other patient data. So you don't mix across patients, which I think is also quite useful because if you start mixing across patients, you don't quite know whether you're introducing artifacts or nodules from other patients by accident. Here you just really operate basically on one single patient. So what you get then is an image, uh, convert an image like this, which has this nodule here into an image where this nodule has basically disappeared. We don't have to be too detailed there, to be honest. Uh, it just has to look pseudo healthy. We know it's not healthy. There might be inflammation around and other things which are not really visible to the eye. So here uh, we, we just see um, in slightly bigger, you see the image with, with a nodule, then the nodule was, has been disappeared. And here you see the difference image after the image reconstruction using deep image prior. So the background has been reasonably well reconstructed, has learned the image. It didn't just copy it across, it learns the image. And it learns how, through that, it learns how to fill in the region. Um, for larger nodules, we even found it starts filling in vessels a little bit. So it's quite, it's quite nice. And it's a fairly simple architecture. It's quite quite easy to implement. So here are some um, some other examples of nodules of different sizes. Maybe start just look at the one on the right, which is a huge nodule here masked out. You see the original image here, F, and then you see it's been filled in. You can still see like you know some bits missing maybe, but um, it, it's it's done a fairly good job. Uh, here's a case which has three nodules, smaller ones which have been filled in. Here's a really big but very diffuse um, nodule which has been masked out and, and filled up and so on. So here's some just different examples. We do actually visual quality control. It doesn't always work that well, but we had just to create a certain number of data sets which allow us then to um, create these pseudo healthy images. And then of course we have the original diseased image as well. And using these data pairs, we can then move to our next step. The first step we did, I'm just showing this for completeness, um, is of course you think that CycleGAN, you can, you can feed CycleGAN um, some, some uh, data pairs, train a lot across a lot of data pairs with without nodules. So on the left column, you see some examples as a result of our in-painting. On the right-hand side, you see the original image with the nodules still present. So you can then train a cycle gun that can actually cycle between those two states. So it actually you can start seeing a nodule if you go from right to left disappearing, or if you go from left to right, you see it emerging and appearing. So we're not claiming that this is how the nodule would have looked like if we would have imaged it earlier. Of course, we can't. We can't turn back time. Um, but we are, we are claiming that we get something which looks similar to a nodule at an earlier stage, which then could be used for training. And that's the whole point. We don't use this for diagnosis or anything. We just use it to be able to augment our training database with, with nodules of smaller sizes. But what we actually got excited about, and this came out last year, this paper by Gilpin, um, and if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a really cute demo. I've got the, um, the, the URL down here. You can actually create little, um, little gizmos like a gecko. You can, you can even remove parts of it and it will start regrowing. So you start with a seed point and having learned how, how this gecko looks like, it can grow a new gecko. I should have shown it with you with a with a brezel because you're in Franconia, yeah? um, but you got a Christmas tree and a ladybird just to get the idea. So this is um, based on cellular automata, which are really a concept from the 1940s. Basically, um, so there's application physics, theoretical biology, and and also microstructure modeling. And they're basically an evolving grid-based computational system. 
uh, which, which allow you to model complex growth. And they're very simple rule based. They're actually looking for neighborhood differences and only grow if, if three, at least three neighbors have the same state and then it also accepts that state as well. But this is a CNN, a convolutional neural network version, which actually can analyze these, these rule sets and, and apply them. And, and if you give it image sequences as training data, it can actually start learning these rules, which is very cute. So it's a, it's a nice way of, of generating uh, something which has semantic background in a way. So here is uh, it's just the example. We implemented this in, in 3D to grow a module. And we basically, again, just operate on an image pair. We don't operate across the whole training database. We just do it on individual image pairs. We train the cellular automaton. We extract the target module from, from the CT. Um, we create the mask. We, we select a seed point. We actually looked at could be used different seed points at different places. Um, there, there are some issues still there to be sorted. Um, we, we use some, just as the original approach, they just use Sobel filters there to basically decide the, the next value of each, each cell. And then we concatenate the outputs and feed it into the CNN. And then we can start growing, growing in Nodjom. So it actually, this is how it, how it uh, is building up. And here you see some results. Uh, we basically have now generations of a nodule, which uh, on, the, on the top left, you just see the seed point. Uh, and then you see the nodule growing across different generations. And then you can insert it into the in-painted image, uh, each, each of those stages. So you actually can see where, where it sits and, and how it would you know, look in, in, if it is embedded in the tissue. Of course, it doesn't model any physical properties as pushing away tissue and, and things like that. It's just, it's literally just pasted in right now. So it, it does not take the wider image context into account. It's just literally just going in nodule, which we then put in our in painted image. So here, are just uh, some examples. You see it's uh, kind of uh, created as a movie, how a nodule is kind of then emerging and growing and becoming bigger until it matches the one always on, on the left. So there you see a still fairly small nodule here, but it's kind of then building up and, and uh, from this individual seed point. You see it looks quite similar. Again, the task is not to completely realistic, it would be great though, the original nodule, but something that where the earlier stages resemble it and it actually goes in the right direction. Here you see a fairly large nodule on the right. Uh, and you see actually it doesn't just grow as a blob or something. It actually has, has uh, learned from the module, nodule how, how it grows in shape. It's not identical in the end. Uh, so we're still looking at convergence and other things, but it's, it's again, we're not using the final version. We'll be using earlier versions in, in our training, like, you know, at this stage, for example. So then, of course, we do the obvious. We see, does it work? Yeah, we, um, we tried the Luna challenge uh, data and we just do a simple false positive reduction task. We just have a baseline approach where we just do a normal training test set. And if we, if we then look at our performance using the CPM score, which is used for Luna, and we sort the results um, by size, we see it works pretty well. The baseline for reasonably large nodules, like 20 millimeter onwards, maybe 15 already, but it actually performs quite poor for very small, small nodules of five millimeter. So that's about you know five, maybe less than five voxels. Um, but if you use our cellular automata approach to augment the training data with many more smaller nodules now in our training set, we actually can slightly lift the CPM score. It's not, you know, it, it is significant, yeah, but it's not 100%. It's, 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 but it's going in the right direction. And we're looking now at more data and more, more realistic data as well. Right, and that takes me to my, my final application. Uh, this is uh, maternal and fetal ultrasound. So I'm, I'm jumping straight in here, but I should probably give a little bit of a background on this. So ultrasound is, is a fantastic and very, very difficult imaging modality. It is operator dependent. It depends how well trained the operator is, how, how they pose the probe, how much pressure they put on. Um, it depends, of course, on the probe frequency. 
and lots of other things. And it depends on the patient breathing, other motion. And in case of the fetus, I mean, that's also not often very cooperative and it's just doing little somersaults and you have to kind of follow your target the whole time. So it's a really, really difficult technique to automate. And we've looked at different problems there. Um, uh, the bottom, you see the usual, um, it's a 3D ultrasound. I should say it's uh, normally we do 2D for diagnostic purposes, but 3D is really emerging as a diagnostic imaging modality. It's, uh, it's still not as high quality as 2D, but you get the added benefit that you actually get the 3D version of the fetus and can do volumetry and not just 2D measurements. Or you can you do your 2D measurements in 3D, which is already a bonus. Um, but on the top, you see another problem is we've got this field of view problem. So if we've got um, at a late point in gestation, it's really important to monitor fetal growth and fetal growth is, is linked to uh, nutrition and nutrition is linked to the placenta. And if the placenta has problems like an infarct, for example, then the baby is starved and needs to be delivered early or some other intervention needs to be done. The problem is then the placenta is, is quite big. Um, I'm not sure how, how, how it's left. Just tried to remember, maybe probably two, more two kilograms at least. So it's almost half the baby size. Um, and it's quite often in the, um, at, at an awkward position, especially in late gestational age, you can only image it in parts. That's why the placenta is quite under-researched. We're also developing lots of novel MRI um, protocols for the placenta dealing with maternal breathing and so on. Um, but this is just this is just ultrasound here in this case. So deep learning really lends itself to ultrasound because um, first of all, we get lots and lots of data. So in a single ultrasound stream, we get like 30,000 images just from one fetus easily. Problem is, of course, the annotation that somebody has to do an annotation of that to, to generate our training database. But the other advantage is if, if you've trained your model uh, and you acquire images, you can immediately apply your model at, in real time, basically. Well, you know, almost as fast as the frame rate of the ultrasound. So actually while you're scanning, you can, can get an interpretation, which is really, really cool. So the algorithms we develop in the iFind project um, are applied in our clinic every week. We just have an extra screen monitor. We have a thinking about how we can integrate it at some point into the ultrasound. We're just commercializing parts of that. Um, but it's, it's a really, really great application of deep learning because you, you, see, you see immediately the results of your work. So one of the things we looked at in ultrasound, this is, this is now not machine learning related. This is just really because we're also looking at robotics here and robotics is really hard um, with, with pregnant women. I mean, imagine one of these big robot hands and you wouldn't want them to come near you in this stage. But we, we, de we designed what we call like a Pullman's robot. So basically we um, designed a, um, a probe holder where we can put two, three, and even four probes in. So you see this, some of the designs on, on the right-hand side. And the ultrasound we have, the Epic from, from Philips, has a, a multiplexer to which we have access. So we can actually connect several probes at the same time. So we can image at the same time. If I say at the same time, it still goes with a frame rate. So one frame per probe. So it's, it's you know, depends on the frequency of the probe, how simultaneous or pseudo-simultaneous the images are acquired. But the advantage of, of doing that is it gives us a wider field of view. It's actually really tolerable for, for, for the mothers. They actually say it's like a, like a massage. I'm not sure how pleasant that is, but it's, it's actually tolerable. It's fairly good to navigate. It's actually almost easier to scan because the um, sonographer doesn't have to think how to hold the probe because it's just by pushing the whole holder onto, onto the tummy um, they're automatically in a very good position and the angulation is, is, is very good of these three probes. So they're actually um, joining up quite nicely. So here are just some images and you see here um, placenta in anterior position, exactly the problem that you only get a partial view of the placenta for different 
views uh, different probe acquisitions. But if you have them in that probe holder, you get basically the image, um, as we show, fused on the right, and the different ways of fusing these data to um, get realistic speckle and, and uh, blending of, of structures. And you actually get a fused view and see the whole placenta in one go. Which was interesting because we asked our sonographers to then segment the placenta in 3D, and they said they've never, never done that. <laughs> they had to learn actually to look at these data to understand where the placenta is because they're used to see only partial fractions of the placenta at this late gestational age. But here you see that manual delineations. So Veronika Zimmer's work is that, um, again, started on, on different experiments there, which she presented uh, in um, Shenzhen in 2019, um, where uh, she just shows here on, on the top a fused view with a, with a manual segmentation. But of course, you want to do this automatically. You want to train a unit and, 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 or some other segmentation. In this case, we literally use vanilla unit from Wonneberger. To, to segment the placenta. So she had different scenarios shown here on the right. So you can feed the individual views of the placenta, even from the multi probe holder, you just use the individual images uh, generated. Uh, the individual segmentations for training, feed it through a CNN and infuse the output. Um, or in the second scenario, you use just a fused view and the, the 3D segmentation generated by our sonographers, which was so tricky because I'd never done that, um, through a CNN and directly get a 3D segmentation. Or you do like a combination of that by, by, by doing first a single view training uh, complemented by multi-view training, always knowing, of course, that this is the same patient, so keeping them as one data set um, and, and then fusing in, in the end the result. This was quite successful. Um, the best result we got from, from the bottom approach, which surprised us, but I think it's a combination of introducing interpolation in the fused view, which is corrupting, kind of um, denoising the ultrasound a bit too much, so we might lose some important speckle um, and other texture. But I think we would have gotten better result with the second approach if we had had more data. We just had fewer data uh, for, for that group where we actually had three probes. We also had two probe uh, views as well. But you can actually do nice things. You can also do MRI for those of you not used to, to fetal MRI. You've got um, the, the baby here upside down already um, going into the pelvis. You can see big eyeball down here. And you see the placenta on top there, um, basically segmented from MRI. And here you see on the left the um, corresponding, this is a two view ultrasound in 3D with a segmentation. And you can transport um, the, the ultrasound um, uh, segmentation into the MRI. We have done just a very global repositioning, no, no registration there. You could, if you wanted to put the whole ultrasound image now in place and use that as a good starting point to run then a 3D ultrasound MRI registration if you if you dare. It's 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 really hard. Um, we should also say the the um, our placenta is not necessarily the best quality. We would we would not be treating MRI as the gold standard actually ultrasound is probably closer to the gold standard than the MRI. Um, and below you just see some some uh, um, animations how that how that looks like where the position of the placenta is with respect to the baby and the fairly good agreement in volumetry at least of the ultrasound extracted and MRI extracted placenta. We would not expect 100% agreement anyway because measurements in ultrasound and MR will differ just by virtue of the imaging physics of the of the um, impedance boundaries versus um, chemical shifts in MRI. So there are differences where you would do the segmentation in both modalities. That's also important, I think, to know. Um, what Veronika Tima worked recently on at, at the last Mikai and um, Pippi workshop was to, to think about problems she had actually, because placenta, the placenta can have different positions. Uh, the worst position is placenta previa where it's blocking the exit, but it's, it can have an anterior or posterior position. So here you see an anterior position. Uh, on the bottom, you see a, a posterior position. And uh, if your network does not know where to look for, it might actually start misclassifying or, or, or failing in segmentations, also depending on how much training data you have. Generally, you have a better view in the posterior view. So there you may get away with only having a single view ultrasound 
for an interior view, you probably need two or three ultrasound probes to fully cover it. Or you could do it by hand, of course. You could acquire three different views, as we've seen, and use that instead. Um, but then you have the problem of how you fuse, fuse those views. The probe holder actually for us more or less solves the registration problem. But what she then did is she um, developed a classification first. So she, by, by looking, you know, having soft annotations of posterior anterior view of the placenta, uh, she knows basically where the placenta is. And then she can use pre-trained networks that were either pre-trained on anterior or posterior and combine that with the classification um, uh, network to actually get a good segmentation. Here's just some uh, quick results uh, or quick schematics on that. The classification network is a normal encoder and classification one, the image segmentation, again, a simple UNET style. Um, you get an attention layer um, out, which actually helps then with the, the multitask uh, approach. And you can then um, do a multitask training where you solve this classification and segmentation task in one go. And then it's almost a uh, final slide now um, on, on fetal imaging. Uh, here you see what would normally happen if you would scan the baby in 3D, the fetus. You see it moving moving about, and you don't get the normal anatomical views you get so nicely in MRI. And also quite often, if you look for facial um, uh, diagnostics in the fetus uh, for different syndromes, you would want to have a really nice um, uh, rendering of the fetus, also nice pleasure scan for the parents, I suppose. Um, but you get lots of clutter on the right-hand side. You hardly can make out. You can sort of see the nose and, and, and mouth, but maybe not to maybe identify uh, lift. Uh, cleft lift uh, lip uh, palette or some things like that. So it's it's it's, it's suboptimal. So Rob Wright um, from my group, he um, designed this uh, registration approach for 3D ultrasound, where he registered all the 3D ultrasound and atlas using spatial transformer networks. And the nice thing is, uh, because it gives at inference time, you could use them while scanning to reorient the fetus always in the standard position. So you would always look at the brain and axial coronal sagittal view, whatever the orientation of the fetus at the moment would be, because it would be very fast to do that. Also, because he's using an atlas, he's got basically a segmentation, a uh, rough segmentation of the fetus, so it can do a quick rendering once it's in that standard view of, of, the, of the face. And you see a really fairly uh, realistic rendering. Um, some of these, these renderings look a bit freaky, I must say, but um, they look really much better than, than the one, the standard one, which you're seeing on the top. And then finally, this is something which is a bit older, but I think this is still for me, the biggest potential of ultrasound. You can do online fetal organ detection. So if you've got soft, weak annotations of the data, which just, where you just ask the sonographer by scanning through a series, okay, every now and then click, say this is abdomen, this is head, this is spine, this is placenta. You can get a rough, um, you, you can actually start extracting uh, this, this information and generating soft proposal uh, maps and, and classify the images as you acquire them. So here you see basically, and that, that works online. We can actually do this online. So we can scan the patient and we could immediately see these soft proposal maps with a classification and a probability um, uh, what we're actually looking at, which I think is really cool. This is really while while scanning, you get you get the you know a rough orientation. This could be a great training tool, for example. Right. So that takes me towards the end of this talk. Um, I think I always want to finish off not with what I've done, but what we still need to do. I think there's, you know, every every talk actually just to just say this this is the work you now have to go and do. Um, I've been even trying to challenge the conventional serial imaging approach by really more tightly coupling the different tools along the imaging pipeline, going from acquisition, maybe to clinical interpretation. In some cases we do in the cardiac, you've seen that. Um, and bringing in imaging physics, biophysical modeling, maybe into machine learning, I think for me holds, holds the answer to many questions. Of course, we want to do things a bit more individualized in terms of diagnostics and prognostics, early treatment, 
detect, early detection and, and prediction of how patients would react to treatment or whether disease will come back is really important. Extracting imaging biomarkers, of course, and discover also new com comorbidities, working on these large population database. We don't just have to focus on the heart or on the liver. We can actually look at the whole, whole human now and actually discover new things. Um, what I think is really exciting what's happening now is that we're looking into emerging and uh, affordable imaging at the same time. So really high-tech imaging on one end and really very cheap bedside portable imaging on the other end. And, and, and the latter apparently is, is, is really good to, to, to accelerate translation to the clinic. And I just want to leave you with some thoughts here on machine learning uh, for what's called P4 medicine in the UK. So it has to be predictive. We want to predict patient response to treatment to select the optimal treatment. It should be preventive. We want to really identify earliest markers of disease so we can slow, stop, or even reverse the disease process. Um, it has to be personalized. That's also called precision medicine, but also looking also at interactions and genes, environment, lifestyle. And what's really important, what, what people have to get into, every one of you, is it has to be participatory. So you have to put patients, physicians, and public at the center of all this because otherwise they will not share their data with you. Neither radiologists nor patients will share their data with you if they're not convinced that what you're doing is, is a good thing. In terms of next generation imaging, these are things I'm really excited uh, about. Um, it's going from ultra high, seven Tesla to ultra low field MRI. I think this is really, really cool. We can do another full thing and we can actually use machine learning to help us with that. Total body, body imaging is happening now. So a pet, basically total body pet, is suitable for pediatrics. Low dose imaging in CT, again, it's for, for early detection of cancer. I think it could be such a great screening tool. Lots of real-time imaging visualization where deep learning could be just immediately applied. And here's just some examples. Um, and point of care imaging. So really trying to bring this to the bedside. I've got my own future opportunities, and uh, and Andreas hasn't mentioned that because he wasn't quite sure whether it's in the public domain, but I'll be actually kind of returning to Germany in May. I'll be taking up a post at TU Munich and um, Helmholtz Center Munich, where I'll build up a new institute for machine learning and, and biomedical imaging. I'll be hiring shortly, so if you're interested, ping me an email. I still still don't have a German email account, but um, I'm still, I'll still be staying at King's as well, so I'm, I'm not ready to leave the UK after almost 30 years here now. If me is around the corner, I'm not sure. I don't think any one of you is going, but we'll try to make talks available. We'll try to have a little bit networking meeting next year. We just we'll, we will announce tomorrow formally that it will be a fully virtual conference. It's it's a shame. Bonhomme is a beautiful island. You should all, I would really hope to see all your work submitted to Mikai in Marrakesh. It will be absolutely amazing. I think this is, again, where affordable imaging, machine learning, deep learning will be such an impactful um, uh, work to present and, and translate. And people are really excited. We've got a, a lot of uh, African researchers in our committee who actually are really, really on board with that. Melba, please submit your papers. Uh, I'm sure I'll give Andreas a lot of work to do as an associate editor. So we're just lifting off. First, uh, papers have been published. We've got a special middle issue from last year lined up. IPNI will have a special issue. So this is democrati democratizing publishing, basically. So it's a $10 submission fee. That's it. It's open access, online only. Double, it's it's, it's peer-reviewed. Um, and we're all putting lots of efforts in that. I think it's, it's uh, I'm not going to do this forever. This is something we want to, to keep alive and, and, and swap people in. If you want to review, please also let me know. To thank all my workers, this was the last time we all got together as a group, December 2019, as a, as a Christmas too. So I haven't seen many people um, over the last year. Um, but, but basically, they have done all the work that I've been presenting. And um, I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And there's also quite a few questions in the chat. And 
um, one of the questions that popped up here is, so you you reported in the end-to-end -end learning where you then also have multiple tasks and uh, essentially multiple outcomes like the image and the segmentation and so on. I would be interested in, you reported that the improving, uh, running this together can improve the image reconstruction and the segmentation. Does it also help for the downstream tasks? So does the, the case-based motion detection and so on improve as well? Uh, upstream, you mean like like actually the line detection? Yes, of, uh, upstream, yeah, upstream. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know actually. Um, I don't think we've measured that. Uh, what we did measure, though. Um, hold on, I'm just trying to think how how we did this because we know we 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 replaced the line detection by the two lines that were displaced just as a test, like as a baseline test. And and the uh, reconstruction didn't deteriorate much, actually. So that means that the detection itself also was quite good. Quite good. So um, that was the only test we did there. Um, and the problem, of course, is, is, is also problem registration, other things. Even if we, if we deliberately displace case baselines, of course, some may already be displaced and we don't know. So none of the images we work with, even their good quality are perfect. So there may be artifacts in there already, which we don't know. We just add more artifacts. So we may in fact sometimes be doing better than the ground truth by correcting even more things that we don't know about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, same would be with, with registration. If we artificially form something and we cover the motion, there's maybe some underlying motion which we haven't considered. So there's, there's this, this small error bound which we don't know about. <laughs> it's very difficult to measure, I agree. So it still would be interesting whether it, it plays a role how, how far apart in the processing the yeah. multitask losses are, are kicking in. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and the, in, the, in the upstream task that you mentioned, the clinic interpretation, we're working on that. We don't know that yet, um, uh, how much we can, we can improve by, by doing the motion reconstruction, how much can we improve the clinical interpretation. We, we are working on that currently and hopefully maybe next, next year we'll have something on that. So I mean, so as far from what what we know from multitask learning, it's always related tasks, and some tasks are beneficial for multitask, and others are more or less independent. And it would be really interesting to develop mm -hmm. a, at least a feeling or some some ideas which tasks are likely to benefit to each other. Yeah. I mean, reconstruction and uh, um, segmentation makes perfectly sense, right? Yeah. And and then the the upstream tasks. Um, yeah, would yeah be that's an important task. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the downstream yeah. task will be the really important task. The upstream task yeah. I care a bit less about. Although what I would want to do is to really do the line detection while we're scanning and actually convert this immediately into a clever undersampling scheme and actually say we, we don't acquire those lines because they're really wrong, basically. Hmm. Um, or we reacquire them. So this is why you can improve the actual acquisition. Um, but but yeah, further further um, downstream, this is where we need to work more. I think mm -hmm. what we've done, of course, we've done um, we've looked at just uh, at the reconstruction and what impact it has on the segmentation as a subsequent um, application that we can do quite easily, and that also made a difference. But of course, it was a really nice find to see that the reconstruction could also be improved. What I really like about your your pipeline is how you get these interpretable intermediate results like you have the the image and the segmentation and then the analysis and the ejection fraction and, and things like that and it, the, do you have a feeling that helps us with with getting the black box character opened into a gray box or yes i mean it's, it will be the next step so if, if if an image fails the quality check you can do two things you can throw it away or we scan or you, you can do something about it. Uh, the second quality check which we do, whether the parameters which we extract make any sense, there would be also good to understand why did they fail? Why did it fail that quality check? And could we again do something about it? We've looked a little bit at, at things um, at IPMI, um, well, it's almost two years ago now. <laughs> um, at, again, also at can can we reason a little bit with the segmentation, for example, myocardium, 
you, you get a nice, can get a good dice coefficient on the diet myocardium, but still might be topologically wrong, right? So can we close the loop, for example? So we brought in like a persistent homology in that um, to, to kind of fix wrong uh, segmentations. We can do a lot with attention maps and, and, and soft proposal maps and all these things and back torch and, and just try and shine a light into the black box. Um, but I agree, it would be good to have a feedback loop. If, if, if something fails a quality check, can we feed that back into the network? Can we actually fix it? Can we learn it? I mean, we start doing a lot of things now feeding in scanning parameters as well, not just the images, but we can put in the field strength, the flip angle, what you want. Um, we could put in the ECG signal, right? As, mm -hmm. you know, as something which we can, we can train on and maybe correct we actually thought we, we probably had the ECG signals for most of those cases, in fact. Uh, but unfortunately, quite often, these are then printed out and scanned in again, and we've got a completely different image analysis problem. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we're developing a new kind of software engineering where these intermediate steps are kind of like interfaces, and then we are, we are essentially developing differentiable uh, programming um, approaches and mm -hmm. then also modularity and, and reuse is a is a huge thing right and I wonder whether your your intermediate steps then can also help with these problems yeah so I had a long discussion with our language geologists on that what they wanted actually the lung project was really designed with with lung consultants, physicians, radiologists and and it was became quite clear very early that they quite often don't know, right? They, they have a high uncertainty in classifying nodule as benign or malignant. Um, and that's why we've got mislabeled data quite often to deal with. But what they were quite clear about is, even though they appreciate that we want to do these really nice, elaborate end-to-end -end solutions, because it's kind of, you just push a button and out pops the result, um, they really want to understand what each of these individual steps are doing. So they really want to take a bit more us, they want us to take more systems approach to really elaborately test each of these elements. So individually in this case, in, in cardiac would be reconstruction, segmentation, ejection fraction, as you know, all these things. And, and only then they would actually start trusting if you build on, on top of that and say, actually can do it in one go. But it gives them more confidence as each, each of the individual steps are individually tested and not, nothing else is fed in. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, yeah, it's a very good approach. And I mean, you have these intermediate results and uh, if you produce them essentially anyway, why not make them accessible and uh, support us to gain trust in the solutions that you're producing? So this is, uh, I found that very, very inspiring. Uh, there's one question here. Uh, one issue with detecting small nodules, lesions is that there is a lot of false positives and there's always the risk for unnecessary, unnecessary biopsies. Do you think that is a risk here as well? How can this be tackled, evaluated in these settings? Yeah, I mean, you have to go through all these quality assurance steps with these things as well. So, I mean, we, we did actually did test this on a false positive reduction task. So we, we um, this was actually our check. <laughs> Are we better in reducing false positives by adding small nodules? Um, this was basically the results I presented. Um, but of course, you know, the recipe is in the pudding. You have to, to apply to lots and lots of data and, and check the results. You have to compare against biopsies, against uh, patient survival, uh, all these things. We are now starting, well, not starting. <laughs> we, we, we had this big AI center and at, uh, at King's linked with lots of other um, London and not other trusts outside of London, in fact, hospitals, where we have now access to longitudinal data of patients. And it's quite interesting. I mean, we've got incidental cases, but we also have um, cases from the, from the asthma clinic who are being followed up and sometimes they find something else in those. Um, so we've got, we start now having serial data, which we, we normally don't have. Normally there's a diagnosis and then treatment starts and, and, and you don't know um, what, what happens or what would have happened. But with serial data, you can actually start doing models and predictions a little bit better. So you can gain a bit more confidence um, in your methods.
So I found this this nodule growing or, or nodule generation approach um, here with this generative approach that you're also sh uh, showing here with the cellular automaton, really inspiring. So the intermediate results they they look to me totally plausible and and very realistic. Did did you did you confirm this with um, radiologists? What what did they say no, about this? <laughs> Yet our radiologists were really busy with COVID over the last year, so actually we <laughs> worked without them in the last year. There have been there had lots of publications, but not on lung cancer, which was really funny. Um, but not funny, tragic. But um, I mean, they, they I look think, fantastic. If I look at the video that you're showing right now, that's that's amazing. Well, I, I'm 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 more critical than you are. <laughs> Thank you. But <laughs> I mean, I'm trained in registration and things, so I always see differences. It's like I'm really good and spot the difference. I I think we can do much better work in the in painting. I think, and we've got some ideas of how to do that now because it's you know sometimes I just joke we could as use might as well use paint shop and you get probably get a, or some texture mapping, right? You can use things from computer graphics and you would get something quite similar. And I, you know I. I've been using things like relaxation labeling in the past. I mean, there's lots of tools which allow you to that way. You don't have to even go into deep learning. But the Salia Automata itself, I think, is nice. I think it's still a little bit too basic. I think you can probably put in a bit more knowledge. So right now, it's really just learning on one patient, uh, basically going from zero to a full nodule, and just as that, that, that learning step. But I think you can, and this is where I'm really interested, you can put in really some more biophysical knowledge of how nodules go in there, I think. So really um, thinking about how cells really taking almost like a multi-scale approach, think about how how, uh, how tumors grow. So if you could couple this a little bit more, right now it's a very simple rule-based model, but you could put in much, probably much more complex, maybe a PDE in there or something some reaction diffusion model, and then what would be more powerful. It's not always regenerate, generating the original nodule. It goes in the right direction, and there's a convergence thing. So, But at some of the cases we've seen now, actually, this is a nice one, of course. <laughs> yeah, but we also have failures. Uh, it's, I mean, maybe texture is a bit different, but there's, of course, many methods how you can uh, deal with the texture and adjust that. But this growth, uh, also the other video that you had where it was growing essentially into a certain direction, looks very plausible from from my naive view on on this. It just in the end, it just has to do the trick, right? So the idea was not to really recreate how the nodule would have looked like if we had imaged it a year earlier. The idea was to create something which looks like a nodule a year earlier and which could be used for training or to help us detect such nodules earlier. And that that were then real nodules. So this, um, yeah, if I were analyzing a, a 4D model or a growth model, I think this would be a very good approach to start with and then add the other things on top that you mentioned. It, it looks very, very promising for, for 4D analysis of growth. So that's a, a really cool approach. Yeah. I, I liked it a lot. <laughs> Only it's just intensity-based, right? But you could think about attenuation as well because you're generating a CT image. So I, I always think of how can you put in some imaging physics as well. Which would be nice. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so with, with all this information that we, that we now get and the future of, of medical imaging and also intervention, what do you think uh, how AR and VR will be involved in this? Is, is this? I mean, there's so many projects trying this over many years. Do, do you see that also uh, now we had the deep learning hype? Is AR, VR the next thing? For me, I think deep learning should feed into AR and VR, right? So we, as you're navigating through a volume, we've got actually a really nice um, uh, AR. I'm never sure. It's, it's kind of like a mix between VR and AR. It's like this thing in between, which has a different name, um, like mixed reality um, approach where we're navigating through a 3D ultrasound and, uh, and we take 3D measurements. So just more accurate measurements of for valve replacements and things like that, which you can't really do on on multi multi plane, you know, just normal standard image viewers. Um, I always think we should kind of find these automatically. We should actually, you know, do a regression or something, could, and, and actually do automatic measurements using deep learning. While you look through that, you actually see a proposed 
measurement already, which you can then still maybe tweak if you wanted to or move a bit, but you can certainly assist um, the interventionist um, to, to do these things. Yeah, so you can move away from just volume rendering and things and in, in VR, but but you know have um, automated segmentation wherever you just look, for example, just segment that volume quickly for me. Yeah, so if I also think this has a lot of potential and it's going to be interesting. I mean, with all the you know the digital twins and uh, that are coming up, I think that um, it would make sense to also use these technologies. But it, it's still early. Uh, the Hololens two is is pretty well is pretty good, right? So also much larger field of view mm -hmm. and it would be interesting yeah, to not, see. We're not using that one, but um, yeah. There are lots of possibilities. There are also like smart microscopes happening, right? They look through a microscope and the cells are being counted for you. You don't have to lose count yourself. Um, so there's lots of opportunity there. I, I think I think VR, AR, the problem is perception, I think. I'm not sure whether you've, you've done lots of these. Um, some people get seasick. <laughs> um, Some people can't use it. There's a problem with color, um, with, with color blindness as well, or, or weaknesses. So you have to be quite careful what, what you what you visualize. I think it's very good for preparing things. So for um, taking measurements, which help you to decide what you should use in an intervention. Guidance is always the problem. And if there's a lag, uh, I would be a bit scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it has to be really real time then. Yeah, I must admit that the already with the with the PlayStation 4, there's a very affordable VR set, and I was surprised how how well it works and has very little tracking. So just mm -hmm. just some markers that I track with the camera, so it's not very intrusive, but um, it has really high quality. So I'm quite quite amazed how these things are progressing. So let's let's see what what's yeah, coming. Yeah, we, we, st we yeah. steal our stuff from the gaming industry and computer vision, of course. I mean, and I try to translate to the medical world is 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 a is a challenge. Sure. But our best researchers go into that direction. <laughs> um, but it would be good to focus, you know, some of the efforts on medical imaging again. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating technology. But it, you also have to show the proven benefit, right? Um, yeah. So that's also why why would you replace something that has a much higher frame rate and uh, lower latency and so on, and just works very well? There's another question: the three probe ultrasound setup. Is there any inference between the signals and the the probes expected? And if there is, how how yeah. do you handle that? Of course, yeah, there will be interference. I mean, you've got impedance boundaries and signal being reflected, and, and yes, there'll be interference. But you can measure it. We've used quantum studies for that. We also now really um, also again go into the raw data. So rather than reconstructing the signal, we're just looking at the RF signals directly, whether you can do something on them, which is quite, quite a nice idea. Um, Uh, right now, we, we don't do much about it, to be honest. Uh, we um, and, and the blending, which we do between the different probes, you can do something very simple like averaging or median filtering or whatever, but we, we, we try to learn it. We try to do things like stitching but, uh, or mosaicing uh, using, using deep learning, but that did not work very well. Again, If you had the segmentation of the structures you're imaging, you could probably model this. You could simulate an ultrasound. So we've also been working a little bit at an ultrasound simulator uh, on that as well. And then you could um, maybe try to alleviate that effect. But to be honest, the um, multi-probe setup, um, what you could, you could just put in one probe uh, or just use one probe or track the probe. Um, but just find, you know, imaging the object from different angles and doing it serially rather than quasi simultaneously would probably do also a good job. But you would need to um, take care of the registration, which in ultrasound I, I keep shying away from. <laughs> It's just too hard because it really it depends so much on the probe direction, the signal. Yeah. 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 No, oh, it's uh, well, amazing how you can uh, construct this large field of view. And of course, there's, there's problems um, 
that arise, but <laughs> it's a really I like cool it because setup. it's so simple, right? You just yeah, yeah, yeah. pop in three, you don't have enough field of you just enlarge it by adding more probes and then just go. I just I I love the idea because it was just like a it looks like a like a Lego toolbox almost. Like how many you can click more in then it's it's quite nice. But yeah, yeah but you have the, the physics problem there as well. But it seems to work really well. So at least the, the images that you've been showing were yeah. very convincing. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting work. Yeah, it, it, but it does, it slows the frame rate for each individual image, right? Because at each firing, you go to the next probe. So it actually reduces the quality of each individual image. That's that's a drawback. I see. So, but you could use three different ultrasound machines and connect it. <laughs> 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 but we haven't done that. <laughs> A bit scary for the patient being beleaguered by several other stuff machines. Yeah, so this was really a, an, an inspiring talk. Um, so thank you very much for, for passing by. And I want to give you also a small uh, round of applause. I hope you can hear that. Ah. <laughs> so thank you very much for the presentation. I have to get used to that again in Germany. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. As you've seen, there have been plenty of questions, really a brilliant presentation, and I'm very glad that we had the opportunity to discuss with her. Obviously, you also might have questions, so take the opportunity, send us your questions, and you can also leave them here in the comments, and I will try to get them answered. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did, and I would be looking forward to meeting you again in another video of beyond the patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.